Uh, good afternoon um, on this glorious um, sunny afternoon in London. My name is Maria Ayres and I'm an academic secretary for the Faculty of Medical Psychotherapy. And I had a great pleasure to uh, chair today's webinar, which is 13th, the 13th one. Um, I have to start from some housekeeping. So um, there is a, we're going to have a question and answer session after the presentations and there is a um, function for you to submit questions on the side of your screens please do that uh, if you have a general question which is not about today's webinar you can also submit it and uh, the college team will uh, respond to that so the uh, title of today's webinar is um, trauma containment and uh, recovery while putting the webinar together um, i tried to choose the topics that would be of general interest not just to the medical psychotherapy uh, faculty but that would be more general to the whole audience and looking at the number of subscribers for today's webinar which is um, kind of around a thousand it looks like um, we've hit the jackpot so thank you very much for all your interest uh, we have three um, excellent speakers today, um, all medical uh, consultant medical psychotherapists and all women. And that made me think how our faculty is often associated with the maternal function, the faculty that thinks and, and nourishes. Um, and the interest today shows that uh, we can do much more and so do the presentation. So without much ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Joe O'Reilly, uh, who is a consultant medical therapist from Huntington, and who would talk to us about organizational containment of anxiety during the pandemic. So over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Could I have the first slide, please, Catherine? I'm going to be talking to you today about how, the importance of how the organisations in which we work function during the COVID pandemic. Mental health trusts have needed to process information, support and contain staff, and to make good decisions under pressure during the pandemic. All of these require the ability to think. So I'm going to be thinking a bit today about the ways in which we can all contribute to this task, the ways in which we have all already been contributing to the task of, of maximizing the well-being of our organizations during the pandemic. Next slide please Catherine. So to start with the statement the well-being and functioning of staff depends upon the well-being and functioning of the organization and vice versa. Um, just to add these slides are going to be available afterwards so don't worry too much about reading them and trying to keep notes or anything. Um, I think this is a fairly simple statement really but I think we're all aware that we function best at work when we feel the organisation is stable and we feel supported to do our work. When the organisation wobbles there can be sort of waves of anxiety through the organisation. Although we can't change the reality of the pandemic very much, I think we can affect the emotional impact of it upon staff and their experiences and, and how it affects functioning at work in positive ways. What, it, what do I mean by the organisation? I'm not talking about something remote, the NHS or the managers. We, the staff, are the organisation and our actions and our attitudes shape the culture of the workplace and how the, how the mental health trust is able to function. Working in mental health, working with disturbed states of mind is a complex task which inevitably and necessarily elicits anxiety. And a key task of the mental health trust under ordinary conditions is to help staff by containing their anxiety and distress, which means recognising its effect and being able to think under pressure. Next slide, please. So a key part of work in mental health is the containment of emotional, psychological and physical component difficulties of our patients. We offer this in a variety of ways. It's a key part of patient care. The staff also need to be contained in order to process anxiety and other projections from our patients into us. This is an ordinary part of our work. We need to be able to maintain the ability to think in order to do this, to understand and process our patients' distress. Psychoanalyst Bion referred to this as the container contained model. In order for staff to contain their patients, they need to be contained and they need the support of their workplace to do the work. 
This containment is usually offered in a wide range of activities, supervision, case discussions, reflective practice, all the formal and informal meetings that we have with colleagues, including the touching base, the brief conversations in corridors. All these are, show, show the ways in which containment is sort of embedded in the fabric of the Mental Health Trust. It tends to be offered in a hierarchical, multi-layered way, enabling staff to perform their different roles in the organisation to avoid contamination of anxiety from other bits of the organisation. And there's also escalation that we can take our things further to different layers of the organisation if our ordinary supervision and case discussions and contact with colleagues doesn't sufficiently contain us. Next up slide, please, Catherine. However, I think COVID brings a new level in nature of anxiety, and I just wanted to spend a moment thinking about this. I've been terming it a bit in my own mind as the COVID mindset. What, are the partic what particular anxieties, what are we facing now? I think part of the issue is there's no blueprint or recent experience to draw upon. We're in uncharted territory. This can lead to feelings of helplessness, loss of control, lack of certainty. This is potentially traumatizing for all of us. Fears about survival and threat to life stir primitive anxieties in all of us, somewhere inside us. We've all been hyper alert and profoundly affected by these, by these kinds of fears. Our contact with patients, colleagues and loved ones have become potential sources of danger. And we as mental as NHS staff have become potential vectors for viral spread, which further isolates us. There's increased disturbance in our patients as they're more anxious, meaning there's increased pressures on us to contain them. But at the same time, we're facing some of the loss of our usual colleague contacts and services. So we've been increasingly working in a more isolated way. The virus pervades all areas of our life. There's a, as well as viral contagion, there's a kind of anxiety contagion. We get limited respite when away from home because our lives have been so profoundly affected. Colleagues, colleagues have been reporting excessive fatigue and also dreams in which COVID and anxiety seem to permeate everything. It feels a bit like we've been in a state of sort of psychic lockdown, not just physical lockdown, a place of constriction and restriction of thought. There's been some great creativity and ideas emerging during the crisis, but I think this has been against a feeling of general restriction and these, these creative um, activities have really been against the odds. It's been a very difficult place to think at times. The effects will vary on all of us as individuals and teams, but I think no one is exempt from the particular and unique nature of the anxieties and the consequences of it that we're facing. Next slide, please. Fight flight mode of functioning is a state of mind I perhaps we're all familiar with when we're facing extreme threat. It necessarily leads to action and reaction, but it does also paralyze thinking and it can be difficult to move out of when we know we're under threat, when we know we're in the situation of lockdown, at least we have some certainty. The ability of the organization to manage anxiety, therefore, at the current time has never been, able, been more important. Next slide, please. I'm now going to describe some of the ways in which um, healthy organizational functioning and its ability to contain anxiety can be optimized and have been being optimized during the current crisis. A lot of this, what I'm going to describe, you may already be familiar with, but I've tried to articulate a bit the things that seem to help, particularly based in the organization in which I work. I think the first point is to identify that there's what I'm calling the COVID mindset permeates every level of the organization and challenges the ability to think. This is I think it's been very helpful when it's been possible to establish a culture and routine activities to address this. Checking in with each other, asking how each other are, buddy schemes, doing this routinely. It's normal and entirely understandable. People should be feeling anxious and distressed at the moment. We can all help each other with that. We can also help to identify particular vulnerabilities and stresses in ourselves and others and our colleagues and to seek have a very low threshold for seeking extra support when needed. These responses are normal and understandable and ubiquitous. Second point, the increased use of defences against anxiety may become problematic. We all need our defences. They, they perform really helpful functions. They enable us to function, but they can also become problematic. Excessive anxiety can lead to increased defences, which can also affect us in the workplace. For example, omnipotence and denial can place staff at increased risk. None of us are invincible, none of us can go on for, uh, forever, and we all need to follow guidelines, look after ourselves and take our leave. Projection and splitting can also increase, and in particular, feelings of inadequacy and helplessness during the pandemic can be located in others rather than our own teams. 
the trouble with this is that it can create further division between teams and colleagues. An example of this, I think, is the way in which some services have apparently become non-essential or, or, or non-priorities, when actually the Mental Health Trust needs all of us to be able to work together and to accept our different roles rather than feel that some teams are left, left carrying the feelings of inadequacy or not being not or helplessness or not being a priority at the current time. Point three, it's helpful to recognise that the fight-flight mode of thinking can lead to a push to take action in response to anxiety. Whilst we are having to make changes and adapt, at the same time, immediate and precipitate action may create further difficulties in the longer term. It can be very helpful to run decisions by colleagues, in particular to pause when things seem urgent. And I think just a word about emails, because of their widespread and their rapidity with which we can send them, they can be very powerful ways to project anxiety into others, perhaps especially on a Friday afternoon when it's really worth checking with yourself. Do I, is this email a communication or am I leaving some anxiety with my colleagues? And in that way, is it serving as perhaps rather a vehicle for projection, projection which perhaps could wait? Next slide, please. Point four, maximise the stability of the organisation as much as possible. And I think we've all seen really how helpful it is to adapt rather than suspend activities. The, the Mental Health Trust, like any organisation, is a bit like a living organism, and if you make changes in one part, it will affect the whole. So helpful, perhaps, to adapt and move to other forms of working rather than close services, and try and maintain things as much as possible, including educational activities that have implicit in them that we're looking to the future and we're looking to the training needs and to the other side of the pandemic. Point five, increased anxiety needs increased space to process it. And this, all of these activities increase the capacity of the organisation to think at every level. This can be helpfully done by maintaining increasing opportunities for thinking from frontline staff to trust board level. Building upon existing spaces and activities can be a helpful way to do this and introduce new ones with staff who are experienced. It may also be necessary. Reflective practice, violent groups, case discussions, staff huddles, places to just address the effects and think about decisions at every level um, can be helpful ways to do this and to share dilemmas and experiences throughout the organisation. Point six talks about the importance of differentiation of staff roles as much as possible. One of the difficult things about the pandemic is not all staff have been equally affected. This needs explicit recognition, so the needs of different staff groups can be addressed. Some staff are and have been more exposed to the virus than others, and they have specific needs accordingly. Staff who perhaps have been able to work from home or have needed to shield from, shield from infection they are also having a difficult time, and a lot of guilt has been reported for somehow not being on frontline duty, and that also needs to be addressed to decrease splitting between these different staff groups. Next slide, please, Catherine. The role of leadership, this is so crucial. Our leadership has had to make some very difficult decisions and to use authority and to try and do this without increasing, increasing feelings of helplessness and loss of control in staff. I, that the attitude of the leadership is crucial to the containment and setting the culture in the organisation. And powerful projective processes can be, can, be, can be going on which sort of look to the leadership to provide certainty and reassurance and the answer to dilemmas, perhaps in quite unrealistic ways. And the trouble with them is that there's excessive projective processes. Staff may lose their own agency and ability to contribute. We're all learning as we go along and we all have a role to play and the leadership don't have all the answers. But also the staff group can be a source of potential creativity to address the dilemmas if, these can be, if some of these can be shared. Communication is key in both content and tone. And in my organisation, daily staff bulletins have provided regular and open channels of communications and have been helpfully showing how decisions are informed by staff experience and feedback, which does encourage a sense of agency and decrease the effects of staff feeling out of control. The leadership can also then be helpfully advised with direct, direct feedback from staff and creativity can be used from frontline staff to become to feed into policies. The leadership can also model helpful attitudes of curiosity, avoiding blame and looking for new learning when things go wrong. Things always go wrong in organisations and it's inevitable when we're in new territory, but the hallmark of healthy organisational functioning is how the trust responds when things do go wrong. 
Actions which may increase anxiety include overly positive messages which ignore difficulties. Those can be very uncontaining. Making permanent changes or restructures during the pandemic increase anxiety, which just increases anxiety in the staff. It's better to help back until afterwards if possible. A lack of staff input into big decisions, including redeployment decisions, can also increase feelings of lack of control and fear. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Catherine. Final few points, the importance of prioritising team and colleague relationships. We know this is crucial to how we do our work. We need to be able to link up with colleagues who may be working from home. We also need to make sure that newly reconstructed teams have the usual structures in place, supervision, team meetings, team building exercises, and induction and training for redeployed staff. We need to feel we're cohesively in, in teams, even if these are new teams, and that we have a clear idea of the shared principles and are able to support each other with the tasks. Triggers and blind spots, fear and threat will trigger reactions based upon previous experience of trauma and loss. I think that this can help be made explicit as being understandable in the organisation as a way to encourage all staff and teams to be mindful of their internal states, their own histories and to seek support when needed. An example may be a team that's had many experiences of patient loss by suicide and have been traumatised by that. They may be terrified at the thought of losing further patients through the COVID pandemic and may need additional support. Point 10, pre-existing fault lines and tensions will be increased, intensified um, when there's increased stress in the organisation. This can lead to arguments and conflicts. This is often not the best time to sort these out during the, con during the pandemic. It's important we try and achieve a unity and are kind to each other. Last slide, please, Catherine. To talk about recovery and repair, in many areas of the country, we seem to be moving beyond the more acute phase of the, of the pandemic. In order to recover, we really need opportunities to process experiences for all staff, and this is best negotiated with teams to think about what form of meeting or reflective space my work may work best. If not addressed, challenging and traumatic experiences are likely to continue to exert their effects within the organisation, which does have a memory. Loss and mourning will be key. The NHS has not been able to provide certainty and it also hasn't been able to adequately protect its staff, and this will need to be openly addressed and worked through. Grievance can inhibit psychological recovery and these difficult realities do need to be faced. There'll, there'll be potential splits to heal between, within and between teams, the difficult reality that not all staff have been equally affected needs addressing and dialogue. Uh, the use of online platforms actually for um, reflective practice and team meetings can help me address this. People at home have had a difficult time too. It's important to address the positive and the creativity and adaptability that's emerged without becoming overly positive. positive. This has been difficult and some positives have emerged, but many organisations and many teams have achieved remarkable things. Coming out of um, the fight flight mode and the socials and the very clear restrictions is also difficult. Lifting of restrictions also increases anxiety. Staff can be supported with data to try and move out of this position and further supported with their anxiety to encourage them back to work. New learning, adapted ways of working, creativity and increased staff bonding has really emerged during this pandemic as well as alongside the difficulties and losses and that these are important to acknowledge so the organisation can continue to learn about itself and to develop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jo, for this extremely rich and, and interesting and, and creative presentation. I wanted to add that you, Jo, with some colleagues, has written a document uh, which is on the college website that expands on those themes. And um, Jo kind of spoke towards the end of her presentation about trauma and loss, which is a, a great introduction to our next speaker, Dr. Stabley, who is a contemporary psychotherapist and the lead clinician for the Tavistock Trauma Service. Uh, we all hear about um, the consequences, short and long-term consequences of the COVID pandemic, and she will help us to think about those who have already entered the pandemic, being traumatized and having sustained losses. So over to Jo, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, first slide, please. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is 
uh, the uh, impact of COVID on a particular population, and it's those who have pre-existing trauma. Now, we're already becoming aware, I think, of the significant and um, wide-ranging and potentially long-term psychological impact of COVID. And I think coupled with that, we are seeing that many of the likely outcomes include post-traumatic symptoms and PTSD across certain populations, for instance, those who have had infection, frontline workers, and also the bereaved. But I think we need to consider the pre-existing trauma population, especially developmental trauma, because it is this group that has a substantial contribution in relation to elevated risk in terms of COVID. And this risk is in relation to a re-traumatization, so further PTSD and complex PTSD symptoms, an exacerbation of um, their current symptomatology, an increased risk in terms of suicide and the potential for self-harm, and an increased risk in terms of the development of other symptoms such as depression, anxiety, fatigue and substance misuse. And all of this leads me to make suggestions in relation to the strategic planning of the COVID response that's going to be required over the coming months and perhaps even years that we'll need to recognise and respond to this high risk group. Next slide, please. So I want to just uh, give this quote by Judith Herman, an American psychiatrist and traumatologist who says, the core experiences of trauma, the disempowerment and disconnection from others, which I think captures so much of the potential COVID experience. Mm. Next slide, please. Just a reminder for the general population how common childhood trauma is. Now, this is a lifetime prevalence best evidence criteria um, review, but we also know as psychiatrists that these rates are greatly increased in psychiatry, sometimes depending on the uh, mental health population, up to 60 to 70 percent. Next slide, please. Sorry, that diagram looks a bit smaller than I would have liked, but what I wanted to do with this diagram was really just to remind you of how much evidence there has been growing over the last 20 to 30 years of the impact of childhood trauma. We know that there are now substantial physical uh, implications, including uh, chronic illness as adults and a shortened lifespan. We also know that it Im impacts on the neuroendocrine system and the inflammatory and immune system, as well as having a substantial impact on the mental health. So there are um, widespread psychiatric conditions that are associated with trauma, and this can lead to either uh, more chronicity or treatment resistance. And we also know that there are the specific trauma-related disorders, which include PTSD, complex PTSD, some of the personality disorders and dissociative disorders. As psychiatrists, we also know that uh, childhood trauma has a significant impact on relationships and on psychosocial factors and functioning. Next slide, please. And as a reminder to you, there is going to be in ICD-11 this new diagnosis of complex PTSD which I think is also a recognition of all of the research that demonstrates the ubiquity of trauma within our mental health population and the need to be thinking about it. The diagnosis will include the uh, standard PTSD symptoms, as well as disturbances in affect regulation, self-concept and relationships. Next slide, please. Now, if we turn to think about the impact of COVID-19 on all of us, I think that Joe has already um, described very beautifully something about what we've all had to live with in relation to the threat of the virus. I really like this idea of the COVID mindset. The threat of the virus um, has activated these very powerful survival anxieties. And as Joe describes, it's also acted the fight flight response. There has been the reality that for frontline workers that has caused significant uh, impact. If we think first of all about uh, some of the studies that are starting to come up, a study by Rossi and colleagues in Italy, 
demonstrated that up to 49% of their frontline workers had symptoms of PTSD, 25% of depression and 20 of anxiety. And we're getting similar figures in China, Canada and the US as well as here. In relation to the COVID infection, the impact of this is also substantial. Uh, there has been, for instance, a study by Rogers uh, that looked uh, both at smaller uh, infection crises such as SARS and MERS, as well as COVID, describing that up to 30% of people have PTSD for at least one year, sometimes up to two years later, as well as um, depression and anxiety, and many up to 20% also having fatigue. Now, in relation to bereavement, again, I think Joe uh, highlighted rather beautifully just how much loss we are all having to deal with and the necessity for bereavement and, and for grieving and mourning, I should say. And what I think we have seen is that the difficulty has been greatly enhanced by um, the reality of COVID, the difficulty of being able to say goodbye, both uh, in uh, the physical presence of someone dying but also the loss of many of the rituals that have that help a grieving family. We also know that the uh, reality of the social isolation and lockdown has caused significant problems, which might be best captured by both loneliness and entrapment. And we have now the psychosocial stresses and the impending economic recession, which are likely to also cause difficulties which, for instance, looking back at the last recession, the risk of suicide increased from, um, by four to six percent. We also know that there has been a reality, despite best intentions, that there's been an impact on mental health services, even with creative moves to be able to address the difficulties. There's still been an impact that has probably had a profound effect on many patients. Next slide, please. So just picking up some of the factors that might be particularly important in relation to developmental childhood trauma. If we think first of all about the risk of getting COVID infection, adverse childhood experiences uh, research tells us that the more childhood trauma there has been, the more likely it is that as an adult, these individuals will have diabetes, cardiovascular and respiratory disease. And this will put them more at risk of COVID infection. There's also a growing body of evidence that they um, have potential inflammatory and immune changes, which again may be uh, impact on their vulnerability. There is an overrepresentation of the uh, of developmental trauma individuals in the socially excluded and deprived populations. And this would include prisoners, homelessness, and the asylum seekers and refugees. And there has been the reality of the lockdown with entrapment causing increased risk for things like interpersonal violence. And we have heard a lot about increased domestic violence over this period of time. Now, the evidence in relation to risk factors for PTSD is very clear that one of the strongest risk factors for PTSD is a history of trauma. So having developmental trauma immediately makes one vulnerable. Other risk factors are around a family history of trauma, but also having other mental health conditions. And post-trauma, what is particularly important in terms of risk factors is the ongoing psychosocial adversity, which again, we're very well aware of in this current situation for people. And perhaps most importantly, this issue around perceived social support. If people feel that they are not supported, then even if they have many people who they could contact, that greatly increases their risk for PTSD, which is also interesting in relation to this whole area of um, the lockdown and social isolation. The other issue around that is in terms of entrapment. There has been uh, quite a lot of reporting of state-dependent retrieval of trauma memories. Now, what I mean by this is if you have a, a, an effective state which is similar to when you have experienced trauma in the past, so in lockdown to feel frightened, trapped, alone for long periods of time, may well then increase the possibility of trauma memories 
being um, reactivated and uh, re-experienced. And finally, this area around neuropsychiatric syndromes. And I'm aware that there's going to be a paper coming out about this in the next day or two in The Lancet. A lot of evidence coming in terms of uh, COVID causing neuropsychiatric syndromes. And one link with um, childhood trauma is this area of uh, the post-viral fatigue. This seems to be linked to inflammatory cytokines. And this is also an area in which childhood trauma also has an impact. So I think we will have much to learn about this. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So this slide is just kind of picking up how we would think about working with trauma, which again, I'm sure many of you will know. But what I want to emphasize is that thinking about the kinds of risk factors I was just saying, it highlights the importance of thinking about relationships and the need to be able to connect with others, which is so central for the therapy. We also need to think about the body. As Bessel van der Kolk describes, the body keeps the score in trauma. A recognition of the reality of external factors is vital and attending to those in terms of the many psychosocial factors is part of treatment. And since much developmental trauma is uh, relational trauma, I think this highlights even more the importance of the therapeutic relationship. And in complex trauma, we talk about this in terms of the three phases of treatment. And just to highlight, the third phase is about reconnection, building those relationships again, which I'll come to in terms of the strategic planning in a moment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you, Catherine. So Judith Herman again says, sharing the traumatic experience with others is a precondition for the restitution of a sense of a meaningful world. And I think we should hold this in mind in thinking about what might be necessary in the future. Next slide, please. So here are some thoughts in relation to strategic uh, planning. The first plea I have is for us to stop calling this a recovery phase. I think that first of all, that links in with a fantasy that we can all have following a significant trauma or bereavement. I wish to go back to how things were. And part of mourning means having to accept that that's not going to be possible. I would also suggest that this may be a time for many of great difficulty and recovery phase does not capture that. So my suggestion is that we call it a transition phase and we recognize that this is likely to need long-term intervention that requires substantial resourcing. Now, I think that needs to be across different levels, starting with population-based, moving to community-based, through to mental health services and individuals. And in terms of population-based, I think that we need to look at how we improve social connection, social resourcing, pro-social behavior and altruism all of which have actually been shown to help people who have had significant trauma. We need to have physical distancing at this point, not social distancing. There needs to be real attendance at a population-based level to psychosocial factors and the inequality gaps and the lack of safety for many. The issues around poverty and deprivation are vital to be addressed. Community-based interventions, I think, need to both enhance social connectedness, but also to improve well-being. And in trauma, there's been some really interesting research that suggests that exercise, yoga, and gardening, which Sue is going to talk about in a moment, have a very substantial impact on people's well-being and capacity to recover. Next slide, please. Coming down to mental health services, I think Joe has outlined beautifully a lot of the issues around strengthening organisations and the questions about change. What I would like to add is that I think that we need to get rid of the market competitiveness and really look at collaboration and cooperation across statutory and voluntary sectors in this period of time. At the mental health level, I think we need to enhance the detection and disclosure of childhood trauma. There needs to be trauma-informed care across all systems, including active service user involvement. And interventions need to attend to both body and mind. And finally, to come back to Joe's point, 
I think it's vital that we contain this work appropriately and look after mental health workers. And next slide, please. I'm just going to end by putting up some of the references to what I have been talking about. Thank you. I'm just going to say thank you to you and um, uh, pick up on what you had said about attending to the body and how the period of the pandemic became also a period when a lot of us turned into where we came from. Um, to green spaces, would that be in our gardens or community parks or on the windowsills? And uh, my next speakers uh, will make us to think about it quite seriously. So Sue Stewart-Smith is also a consultant medical psychotherapist, not surprisingly. Um, and she, her presentation is called Managing Pandemic Related Stress, the Benefits of Gardening and Connecting to Nature, and is uh, based on the book that she had recently uh, published. I'm sure she's going to tell us about it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Anyway, I hope you can. I'm thrilled to be here today um, and to have a chance to talk, talk about uh, the book that I've published, uh, which actually came out right in the middle of lockdown and um, in April and has turned out to have enormous sort of relevance really to this current crisis in various kinds of ways. So um, I'll just say a little bit about me. I worked in the NHS for 15 years as a consultant running a, a district psychotherapy service in Hertfordshire and I now work for the Doc Health team which is based in the British Medical Association in London, uh, supporting uh, doctors through psychotherapy uh, who are suffering from burnout and stress. So I think one of, one of the things that's been coming up is, is our need to connect with each other. But uh, that, of course, has been the unique aspect of this crisis is that it's been uh, social distancing has made that so extremely hard in terms of managing the extreme feelings, fears, anxieties, and various kinds of losses that, that everyone or many people have had to go through. And that actually we've been, many, many people have turned to nature. Um, and right at the start of lockdown, there was a remarkable phenomenon where people started buying seeds. And many people who had never gardened before uh, started germinating seeds on their windowsills. At this moment when the world was filled with uncertainty, the human world anyway, uh, uncertainty and anxiety, spring was unfolding and it was an incredibly beautiful spring in, in this remarkably sort of, you know, celebratory way um, and was unperturbed by everything that, that we humans were having to deal with. And that was deeply calming and reassuring for many people. It also highlighted the enormous importance of regeneration, uh, natural regeneration to the psyche and how stabilizing it can be and how it can give us something to hold on to in times of crisis. And one of the reasons I chose the subtitle for my book, which is Rediscovering Nature in the Modern World, is because many of these aspects have long been recognized to be helpful for mental health. But we are now, we, in the last, 10 to 20 years, uh, a, a database of evidence-based um, evidence research has, uh, has emerged on the effects of nature on us. Um, I'm just a bit worried I'm getting that. That's fine. I was worried there was a message from the organizer. Um, so I think we'll go on to the next slide, please, Catherine. So I'm just gonna talk about the concept of biophilia briefly. Uh, the, the, the word was uh, coined by the great biologist, Edward Wilson, um, as, a, as a love of living things. And he believed this was innate in all of us. And that, you know, it's something we, we get in touch with and we can lose touch with. But it is there. And he, he believed inscribed in our genes through evolution, through un, our, our, our need in the course of our uh, adapt adaptation as a species to survive in nature. The concept can also encompass our attachment to life, so there's an emotional component to it too. And 
there's also a concept of urgent biophilia, uh, which was uh, recognized by a, a socio-ecologist called Keith Tidball, who studied people's responses to war, war zones and um, na following natural disasters. And the, the remarkable uh, sustenance that people gained from rec in, in, in terms of recovery through through planting trees, through gardening, through horticulture, through through nature. Uh, now I had my own uh, my own experience actually of this. Having written the book, I'd had many many um, many benefits from gardening over the years in terms of how calming I can find it. It clears my mind. It's an, a physical outlet. Uh, I can shape a bit of my world, and that that's that feels creative and it feels empowering. But actually, for the very first time, I was part of this this uh, reaction to the COVID anxiety, and I, in particular, I I clung on to these tomato seedlings that I had. I, I was germinating them in the house where it was warm, and I would open the curtains every day. They'd be the first thing I would look at before re look, looking at the news. And the fact that these tomato plants were growing every day almost took, took on a kind of symbolic meaning for me um, uh, and uh, just, just was a very, a very good way to start the day in terms of my mental state. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, uh, so, yes, just to move on to some of the science that I spoke about earlier. Um, the anti-stress effects of nature have been well, uh, well documented and uh, they're mediated through the autonomic system. Um, and that they include lowering of heart rate and blood pressure as well as cortisol levels. And what's important in that is it's about green nature particularly and um, the kind of landscapes that perhaps in evolutionary terms would have signaled that this was a flourishing place, it was a place that would be beneficial for survival. Uh, the other thing I think I want to flag up is the importance of immersive activities, because we can think that we're getting contact with nature by, by exercising outdoors, but if you're plugged into your headphones and um, you know, actually zoning out, not really noticing what's around you, then, then you're not getting the same amount of benefit. Uh, you may still get the sunlight and the fresh air, but you're not getting the psychological benefits. So these kind of immersive activities include gardening, but also hiking, fishing, bird watching, um, and they also help to reduce rumination. They provide a form of mindful focus. Um, and the other thing to stress is that this is this is uh, this replenishes our ability to to focus the mind and to concentrate after after that kind of exposure. Can I have the next slide, please, Catherine? I'll just mention briefly because um, there was a lovely news story about uh, um, uh, an 83-year-old man called Robin Hanbury Tennyson who uh, spent five weeks in an I ICU in an induced coma in Plymouth. And um, the, the moment that he came back to life and felt himself coming back to life was when he was taken out into the garden. Uh, and there are, there are increasingly uh, ICU gardens, small gardens, uh, being developed because they, they, are, they, 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 help, they help after ICU is very disorientating, obviously traumatic, um, and it helps people reorientate themselves, um, brings them back to a sense of, of a normal life. Um, so the other, the other bit of evidence which is compelling here is to do with post-operative patients who have been shown to require less pain relief and have lower levels of stress as well as better mood and are discharged in many studies on average a day sooner. But the other aspect of the garden is the uh, emotional impact on the patients and the relationships that, uh, that people form to elements of the natural world whether that's the trees or the flowers or the birds. And in terms of combating isolation, which has been such a, a large part of this crisis for, for everybody, really, the natural world provides a form of companionship that we can easily overlook 
um, and many people experience the value of that uh, at home. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, I'm just going to put this up because it's uh, one of the inspirations for writing the book was my grandfather, who was a prisoner of war during the First World War. Uh, and he, I grew up with the story of how his recovery uh, really came about finally through, through attending a horticulture scheme um, in the aftermath of the war. I'm not going to say too much about the war now, but I think what's important in relation to this is, is how much how much of the time we heard people drawing parallels to the war, uh, to both the First and Second World Wars. Can I have the next slide, please? All right. Just to go on and to link up with some of the things that Joe has been talking about, Joe Stubbley, about trauma. So gardens in particular create a feeling of safety, and that is the very first principle of recovery from trauma. The other, the other aspect of gardens and parks that's important is the, is the, is that they combine something that um, uh, environmental psychologists call prospect with refuge. So we have a sense of a vista, a view, as well as a kind of uh, a protected space. In terms of gardening itself, um, when we, when we are, when, when we feel traumatized or very, very anxious, there is, a, there is often an overwhelming experience of powerlessness or helplessness. And one of the things that helps many patients suffering from PTSD through gardening is recovering a sense of their capacity to shape their environment. And Bessel van der Kolk, he doesn't refer to gardening in, in his book, but he does talk about the need to restore a sense of physical efficacy as a biological organism. I'm going to go on to the next slide because I can see time. Um, so just, just, to, just to sort of think a little bit about stress and burnout in relation to a remarkable project that I visited in Sweden, which has pioneered uh, garden, gardens, therapeutic gardens as a rehabilitation for people who've been off work suffering from burnout and stress, most of them for two years. Um, and one, they've described a number of things. They've published quite a lot of papers on, on different aspects of their program. But the importance of, of the senses, the non-verbal aspects of the garden, that through, through, through this, people are able to reconnect to their body and also to their feelings. And, and this comes about through the presence of water, stones and trees. The other aspect that's very important, uh, when interpersonal relationships are very, feeling, feeling very complex or full of intense emotion or feelings of being judged or criticized by others, there can be a feeling of unconditional acceptance in nature, which is therapeutically very helpful. And the other, the other aspect is the importance of care, um, that our care system is actually neurobiologically linked to endorphins and oxytocin, um, and that through care, uh, what they find is that people who, who are depressed in, the, in, their, in their groups who are depressed um, and suffering from burnout, who are very, very self-critical, internalize something much more self-nurturing. And I just want to end with a quick note thinking about the longer term future. Could we go on to the next slide, please? So, yes, in terms of how thinking about how we we collectively might come out of this uh, crisis. And we, one thing that's been very clear is how much the pandemic pandemic has highlighted the uh, social inequalities in the in the in the. In, in society around us. And one of those has been, of course, access to green space. Lockdown was a very, very, very different experience, a much harder experience. You know, Joe used the word entrapment uh, for people who could not get outside uh, or who could only get outside for a fairly brief bit of exercise and who didn't have a green park in their neighborhood. One piece of research that I came across in, in, uh, in writing my book, which made a big impact on me, is this study done by the, um, a team in Edinburgh and Glasgow. 
and it was actually a pan-European study, but it, it looked at different amenities that could be in, introduced into socially deprived communities and measured their impact. And the only one, um, and this included you know, all sorts of community resources, the only one that had, had a significant impact and a large impact was green space. And they, they estimated that actually in, in increasing green space in those communities could reduce the, uh, reduce the inequalities in mental health that are associated with low income by as much as 40%. Uh, and I also just want to end on, I started by saying this is about connecting to nature rather than, you know, Joe, the two Joes have been talking about our need for human, human connection. Um, that actually the evidence shows that nature garden projects in particular can act as a social bridge and help integrate people and bring them together in an unthreatening way and create a kind of an environment of shared pleasure often evolving around shared food um, but but also um, a, an, an unthreatening place where people people can meet and, and exchange ideas um, uh, and that that's very important in terms of trying to create uh, a, a sort of community focus. Okay, I've just I've just put up the um, if you do the next slide, I've got some references there, um, just so everybody can see them. But they're there if you want to look at them later. Thank you. Well, I'm so sorry you had to look at the upside down. <laughs> well, so thank you very much. Um, and kind of listening to. Your presentation also made me think about the idea of paradise, which is something that has been kind of shared by many cultures and how that is an yes. ideal place where one yeah. can enjoy well-being yeah. in its yes, highest yes, form. Yes, yes, yes. And thank you for mentioning Doc's health, because that was something that was missing from the college webinar on well-being. Yes, yes, yes. I think yes. it was a wonderful service. No. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. Actually, just in terms of paradise, I wanted to say um, that, uh, that the garden is a safe place and a refuge. But if we're thinking about managing loss, it's also it's not really like the Garden of Eden. You know, there is death in the garden um, and that through the natural cycle of life and working with it, we can actually come to sort of experience loss in a, in, 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 in a, in a, in a different way. And, and some, many people find it easier to accept. Um, through 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 having contact with nature. Great. So we are moving now swiftly to our uh, question and answer mm. sessions. Um, can you hear me all? Is that yeah? Okay, great. So my first question is to Jo O'Reilly, who has had some time to kind of collect herself from her um, presentation. And the question is, what do you think about the recent general overtly positive message? presented by the government in UK, some of it could be misleading. Oh, um, gosh. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm not sure I can comment too much on government policy. I'm with you a bit on the idea of things being overly positive and perhaps action to lift restrictions suddenly, very rapidly, but also in a way that doesn't feel very thoughtful. We have no way of knowing which restrictions being lifted are likely to lead to what outcomes. If we're suddenly we can be a metre apart, suddenly we can go to pubs and restaurants, suddenly we can go to hairdressers. How on earth are we going to learn from experience and, and what works and actually what increases risk of exposure? Um, so yes, I think caution and a sober pathway through this with perhaps an emphasis on the reality that we are moving through this. We don't need to be in fight, float, fight mode anymore in, in, in certain areas. We can start to um, enjoy more freedoms, but also perhaps there is a bit of a rush to do that. And I wonder, I wonder where that comes from really, rather than staying perhaps more closely to the a, a, a sober, sensible, considered pathway through it, which can also allow some lifting and some respite from the lockdown. Sure, in many ways I was thinking that the paper on the organisation well-being would be useful not just in mental health trust or NHS, but would be used in a kind of any organisation. And I've tried it on some people who are not in NHS and they found it helpful, so thank you. Uh, then I've got a question about people who survived childhood trauma, so that would probably go to Joe Stubley. 
and go on to have greater risk of diabetes and other physical health problems. Is that felt to be a direct effect somehow, or is it an indirect one via the risk, other risk factors such as smoking, diet, weight management, etc.? I think that's a really good question, and you know, I can see how you can easily get into answering. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a great question, and the adverse childhood experiences um, research doesn't really help us to answer that yet. What it's done is allowed us to see these connections. Um, the evidence, I, from what I'm aware of so far, is that it is certainly strongly connected with a lot of the other risk factors, and this is one of the difficulties for childhood trauma, that there are often layers of problematic you know, um, sort of risk factors that get laid on top of each other so that if you're more likely to be feeling under threat all the time then you are also more likely to use substances that might help you manage that threat which is also then more likely to cause problems in terms of your physical health but there's also a lot of interesting research around epigenetic changes and just looking for instance at the idea of um, childhood trauma causing problems with the telomeres um, on chromosomes, which has been strongly linked to a um, shorter lifespan. So that's an independent thing. So I think we've got much to learn still is the short answer. Absolutely. And it's a, it's a, it's a really important question. And, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, another question that's connected to that, do you have any idea about how COVID may specifically affect young people who have experienced trauma, Joel? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure whether they're meaning by young people, whether they're talking about children and adolescents or young adults. I imagine so, and I think that's probably interesting to hear what you think about that. Young people. Okay. It might also be a question about, you know, young generation, the people who are yeah. kind of in university and going into that world that is full of anxiety. I, I mean, I think that's right. I, I think that there is certainly a, a real difficulty in terms of the many losses that young people have had to face. You know, I think there's been such a, a, a sadness in relation to seeing school aged children and what they've lost in the lockdown in terms of their connection with others, in terms of their education, in relation to what they've had to bear um, when, when one thinks about the kind of markings of time that they've missed. But also to be living in a world in which there's so much uncertainty and this way in which kind of struggle with a kind of illusion of control over our lives and these children have had to learn that we don't have control that anything is possible and uh, you know that kind of ordinary omnipotence that we have isn't available so I think we're going to see that there's likely to be a profound impact and just to add I think that for a lot of young people getting involved in the Black Lives Matter movement has been really important in terms of taking back some sense of control. I am so glad that you've mentioned that because I have a question which I think that perhaps all of us can try to think about, uh, which is how do we deal with the added emotional challenge with addressing racism? Which of us are you addressing that to, Maria? Or well, I'm to thinking it was the panel. I mean, is anybody particularly um, interested in answering this question? It feels like another layer, doesn't it? And and kind of also very anxiety provoking and very threatening. Um, very kind of much about the survival in a different way. And with majority, you know, kind of for the BMA patients dying more frequent. Yeah. I think that really tapped into that too. But I think there's also the reality that trauma does cause those big survival anxieties that we were talking about and one way of managing those is splitting and I think we saw all of the kind of splitting that encourages racism in things like Donald Trump's idea of this being you know the Chinese virus yeah. this is one of the difficulties that one gets into that it becomes a very black and white world when that level of anxiety is around but I think you were going to say something as well Joe. 
I was just going to comment on the um, something I said in my um, part of the presentation about not all staff groups being affected equally, and mm -hmm. um, the emphasis really on black and minority ethnic groups who that the increase staff members who are at increased vulnerability are becoming unwell or dying, and some of whom have died as a result of the pandemic, and that being something mm -hmm. that really can't be turned away from and needs proper recognition, mm -hmm. search and um, support um, and addressing in, in all of our workplaces. There are differences between us and differences in how people are affected and it's not like we can't turn a blind eye to that. Yeah, and I think course, that's right. I think that's right. Oh, I can't, I think I'm no, muted. I'm, I'm kind of I'm thinking, not, that, but you're not unmuted. I'm not muted, okay. okay. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on what Joe was saying um, uh, and the turning a blind eye because I think, I think this crisis has sort of it has opened up these these big big like a sort of crevice really a sort of big big social issues, and and I think you know it, it brings to my mind you know Winnicott's um, when he wrote about a breakdown can can you know is, is it's a breakdown but it can also be a breakthrough, and and I think it, you know we are being fo we have to attend to these things we're being forced to think about them we really have to and and it's the same with the with the climate crisis as well. Um, you know that actually we really do have to attend to all the different very unsustainable ways in which we have been living and exploiting nature and exploiting people uh, as you know as, as a as a planet really actually it's not just our, you know our society so I think this is about conversations that need to be had and how to how to how to how to facilitate yeah, that sort of I was just looking at the panel that that might include our own faculty and kind of thinking how we can get people from other ethnic minorities to join our faculty, how we can make it easier for them to um, to get interested in our special. Um, I have got another question, which is about what in some ways, I think it's a, it's a very generic question about that, that can go to any of us or perhaps all of us, which is about working with people through the telephone, that the persons who ask the question found that it's not always helpful. And uh, the question is how one can develop therapeutic relationship through using digital methods. Can I just suggest that could be a, another whole webinar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's something we're all having to deal with in different ways and it's not easy. Um, yeah. And again, um, that, just to mention that our exec of our faculty has been working very hard, putting, you know, kind of trying to work through this difficult time, initially meeting weekly, now meeting fortnightly. And we have had put a, a, a another document on the college website that's right joe i think it should be there you're one of the yeah. co-authors about some principles while working with people remotely do you want to say something about that yes i was just going to say i, I think there's we've all had so many of us have had to move to digital ways of working um and there are real issues about um both trying to keep some connection with our patients, but also the very jarring experiences of the distances and the disconnections between us. And I work in a psychotherapy service, and a lot of the, I actually think a lot of us prefer telephone sessions to the experience of using ca cameras because there's so many, I think we've seen a bit during this, there's so many misattunements, misunderstandings um, that can happen when you're supposed to, think you see someone, that means you could connect with them better. But I think it can really highlight and magnify the misattunements, the, the lack of mirroring, the lack of understanding that many of our patients have experienced very early in their lives and been very damaged by. So I think it does raise real issues and I, I think we have to be very cautious about a sort of rush that sort of one of the things that we've learned has been that we could be flexible and adapt and we don't need other people we can have telephone consultations or video consultations. I do think there is a role for all of these models of working but um, I don't think that they're a replacement for being in the room with our patients for many areas of our work. They may increase accessibility, they may be needed in some cases, but I think one of the things, speaking for myself really, is that um, there are poor relations to experience actually being in the room with somebody else. I also wanted to pick up on something Sue was saying about what the COVID pandemic is showing us, and I think it is showing us some things about ourselves and as a species, which are very difficult realities we need to face, both in terms of splits and divisions, prejudices, inequalities in society, and our treatment of the planet, because COVID is so much generated from that context, yeah. treatment of wildlife, that, that 
actually there are huge amounts for us potentially as a species to learn from this crisis if we're able to look at some very difficult things and take a long hard look at them and, and to learn about ourselves and what changes we need to make going forward. And can I just say in terms of the telephone, a disembodied voice when you're trying to work with trauma is really difficult. Including what includes work with the body and kind of including yeah. the body within the therapeutic space. And yeah. that kind of leads me to, I think, probably my last question, which is about the EUPD patients. And uh, they appear to be more susceptible to being re-traumatized. Is there any specific approach that would work for them? I think that you've covered a lot in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I think that everything that I've been saying applies yeah. to emotionally unstable personality disorder. I think there is a, a large crossover and obviously there's an ongoing discussion about that in relation to complex PTSD and EUPD, but I think that there's a big overlap in terms of you know, these, the kinds of things I'm describing also helping those patients because I think they are at very high risk of re-traumatisation. Absolutely. So just to give each of you a last word, starting perhaps with Sue, as she kind of was our last presenter. Um, well, I, I don't know that I've got a last word. I think I think I would just want to reiterate what I said earlier about how we need we do need to look, take a deep look and have lots of discussions, actually, about, about the nature of this crisis and 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 i think to include nature in that i mean one of the things i hope is is that um that you know so many people have had this feeling that i describe my tomato seedlings on the windowsill as it were you know so many people have felt the 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 replenishment you can experience in nature and the and the sense of the sort of stabilizing effects of that that actually that it might lead to us just thinking well in general uh this you know this is of course the very experiences that patients across the ages who've benefited from horticultural therapy have found in it, you know, who've been traumatized or uh, had had losses or kind of um, childhood experiences that Joe's been describing. Um, and since we've all felt that in a, quite a powerful way, I hope that that might mean it's it's sort of it's seen as part of the future for, for therapeutic um, work. It makes me think about the universal language of gardening, you know, that there is something very universal that goes across. Joel, Joel O'Reilly, first maybe. I suppose just to link a bit with my talk, um, I hope that from one of the things that we'll be learning, and there's a huge amount of learning from mental health trust, is, is the importance of containment, really. It's one of the sort of softer things in psychiatry and that can be underestimated, the importance that we can properly contain our patients. It's so much of the care we provide, but it's somehow not sort of up there in terms of medication or diagnosis or more sort of, active based things as opposed to something that's more um, processing and thinking and developing a sort of relationship with the patient in the position of holding holding we do it yeah. but we don't quite articulate it and in order yeah. to do that staff also need to be held by the organization i'm fortunate to work in an organization that has a lot of reflective practice and panels and ways to support staff in their work and i hope that this kind of learning will, will continue to be built upon so that we're able to um, support staff to do their work and care for our patients um, in a way that makes clear the importance of these these processes. Thank you. And Joel Stubbley? Oh, it's hard to think of just one last word, but I suppose what I would really like to put a plug in for is the, the idea that actually we need to be able to stop competition in terms of the NHS to really adequate resource what is going to be required because we've had years of austerity. And I know that we've been really worried about frontline staff, but I think we need to make sure that we actually have proper services with mental health staff as well as frontline staff who can actually attend to really helping look after people in this transition period and in the years ahead. Thanks, Thank Maria. you very much. Thank you. What I kind of think is that I really wish that we would hold on to things that we had learned, the positive, the, the kind of developmental, creative things that we had learned or got in touch during the pandemic and 
that somehow we continue thinking about them and working on them. Well, very much. Thank you to all my excellent speakers. And, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed your talks and I hope that our audience as well. Thank you to Kate, Catherine and Emma, without whom this would not take place. They were our uh, technical support from the CALC. Um, I wanted to say that our next webinar, no, well, call it web, next webinar is on the 2nd of July and it is going to be on celebrating International Congress. And one more thing for those who are interested in thinking about the ideas that we discussed today, uh, later in the autumn, we are hoping that um, our annual event um, at, at day at the college called Psychodynamic Psychotherapy would be um, there for you uh, remotely. So please watch out for the um, adverts for the Psychodynamic Psychotherapy. I think that um, what today's proof is really how much um, we can contribute to the work of our colleagues across the board within all the specialties of the college, all the uh, faculties. And um, I hope that we as a faculty will continue uh, building on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.